My background is in applied machine learning about 15 years. I was always multi-major and, and playing around in different domains. Uh, I started out in the hedge fund business building machine learning strategy, uh, trading strategies in the early 2000s. Spent a couple of years at Google working on some of their largest distributed systems. And I've been doing AI startups for about 10 years now. Uh, I've managed to pawn off everything I've started onto some other bigger companies so far. Uh, last one we sold to LinkedIn in December 2015 and currently runs all their newsfeed ranking and their natural language processing stack. And I'm also a founding partner of Data Collective or DCDC, which is the leading AI focused venture capital fund in the world with uh, just over a billion in capital under management. We started that back in 2011. So I'm good at raising money and selling stuff to people. Um, I'm going to talk today about vertical AI startups. Uh, the two big buckets of stuff I'm going to talk about are kind of the thesis around this and why you should care about doing vertical AI startups. And then the second is sort of the process for how to find interesting ideas and execute on them. Um, so I'm not going to go through all this stuff. It's going to be an interesting presentation. I'm going to kind of very, <laughs> I'm going to very loosely use my slides. They're merely, merely a scaffolding for the talk. Um, so when I talk about a vertical AI startup, I mean four specific things. They're, they're full stack products. They require deep subject matter expertise. Uh, they leverage proprietary data. And the core value is the AI. I'll explain what each one of these means. One. So full stack means you know all the way from the data to the machine learning models, all the way up to like a UI or or some kind of a deployment in like a high tech manufacturing facility or something like this. It's really the entire value chain. It's not like an API for natural language processing or something like that. That's horizontal AI. We don't really mess with that. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, subject matter expertise. Um, when you take this approach, this full stack approach, you're, you're going to solve a business problem directly. So you have to have strong subject matter expertise in the team, on an advisory board. Um, you may not start with that, but you need to get it into the company as quickly as possible. Um, you need to be able to be like kind of recruit people from different areas, so get people jazzed up from a uh, from completely different domain that you may not know anything about. This is pretty crucial. And you got to be able to sell into that domain. So you got to be, you know, some. You got people have to be real, be able to respect your company that you actually are competent in this domain. Um, proprietary data, very important because over time, if you want to have defensibility in your business, you can't just have commodity data that anybody else can get. Right? It's going to be very easy to replicate your business if it, if some if you get really lucky and something actually works is very rare, so you don't have to worry that bad. Most of the stuff you do isn't going to work. But if the, business, if the business actually works, then somebody's going to easily be able to copy it, and that's bad, right? Uh, and then AI has to deliver the core value. When we first started Data Collective back in the, uh, like, kind of 2010-ish, when we really started having these serious discussions about this, I coined this term that I called the data sidecar. So this is like, Amazon or uh, Facebook or Netflix are great examples. I mean, these are great technology companies, and they actually have world-class machine learning research teams. But it's a sidecar to their core business, right? Amazon is a store. Netflix is a, a movie streaming company. Well, it used to be that they sent you CDs, right, back in the day, um, and then uh, even Facebook, right, is actually like a social network. Right? But if you look at the core of their products today, how do they drive engagement, how do they drive revenue? Actually, the majority of it is coming from these recommender systems. Netflix has put these numbers out publicly that about three quarters of their revenue is in some way or another driven by a recommendation from their recommendation engine. Um, if you look at like Facebook, for example, you know, again, over 50% of their engagement and their revenue is coming from uh, machine learning, driving the newsfeed ranking and driving the ad recommendations. But nevertheless, even though so much of the core revenue lift comes from machine learning, the core of their business is a different thing. So that's not what we're talking about here. Here we're talking about the core of the value that you deliver is actually the AI from day one. And if you look at those three companies, Facebook, Amazon, and Netflix, all of them started without like world-class machine learning embedded into the product. This was a later thing that they did to optimize the product. 
So very important to understand that's different. Okay, so why go vertical? So we got the uh, good old Gartner hype cycle on the right there. Um, and you can see that at the moment. When the Gartner guys have caught on to something being late stage, <laughs> then you know, you know you're, you're kind of past the prime, right? Stuff's, stuff's starting to smell a little bit funky. So, you know, up here at the, the little bit past the peak there, a little bit past the zenith, <laughs> you can notice the deep learning and machine learning. Um, my view is that this largely has to do with the horizontal kind of thing where everybody's just talking about AI all the time. Every startup pitch deck has AI in it. Uh, people are changing their LinkedIn bios all of a sudden. So you get these LinkedIn notifications that all of a sudden the homie that you knew back a few years ago, you know, isn't even technical at all. All of a sudden they're a machine learning guy now. You're like, what happened there? I don't know. Um, but luckily, uh, luckily, blockchain came along. <laughs> so you see a lot of those same, a lot of those same cats that changed the bio to machine learning. You know, all of a sudden now they're blockchain experts and crypto investors. So that's good. That's helping. It's helping us out a lot. But nevertheless, we are at a late stage kind of horizontal AI thing, right? And, and it's failing to solve the business problems. I, I like. Uh, the comment that our, our dear friend the CISO had earlier, which was like, people are coming up and they're like, so what are your problems? <laughs> and they're like, why do you ask? You, you don't happen to be sick in my office without any idea what the hell you guys are building, do you? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what's going on. And that's one of the problems. You're not solving a business problem directly at all. You're just kind of like, you've got some stuff, you've got a hammer looking for a nail, and you're not really able to capture significant value or find your place in the market. Um, and then secondly, the, the tasks are commoditized very quickly. So you might have a state-of-the-art you know, computer vision model today, um, but this, this is going to be something that's kind of very easy to build in a, in a, with an open source library six months from now. And I would argue that over the past, especially five years, you see that that commoditization cycle is really accelerating pretty tremendously. So stuff that um, is really, really novel and really state-of-the-art becomes things which are, are just any solid machine learning team can set up really quickly. Now, don't confuse this with like the old, like we're gonna build this in TensorFlow thing where people don't know what the hell they're talking about, because that's not gonna happen. So the commoditization where like anybody can just randomly build machine learning models is not gonna be the case. But the idea that, you know, if, if Microsoft publishes a paper about state-of-the-art, kind of uh, translation for Chinese or something. And then within six months, a bunch of other really good machine learning teams can also replicate that result. That's what I'm talking about. So this is about really good teams. It's not about everybody just being able to do this stuff at will. We're not there. Um, and you know, I think because of my experience with DCVC and my own startups, I feel you know, confident that I can claim that we understand way better than everybody else for the most part because of the battle scars, like what's going to happen here and the value that will accrue to the vertical approach versus the horizontal approach. Um, also, enterprise exits come in cohorts. I'll show you this later on some interesting analysis about how enterprise works from a, a market value perspective. But it tends to be the case that um, you'll, a vertical will kind of see many wins mature at the same time. So you have opportunity to have many multi-billion dollar companies within a vertical cohort, um, as opposed to in the consumer space where of course the value largely accrues these massive long tail exits where you have like Facebooks and Amazons and so on that are worth you know $100 billion or more, um, but you have very, very, very few of them. Okay, so why go vertical? So number one is don't get ripped off, right? The way that you get ripped off is when there's a vendor who's solving a business problem or a company who's solving their own business problem and you're just merely selling the other person a tool to do that because you're in an unleveraged position. You're disintermediated from the end customer and buyer. You have really no control or no leverage. So when you go to negotiate things, you're really not in a good position. You're in a position of weakness and you'll, you'll gradually be marginalized and your margins will be horrible. Um, Tasks get commoditized, like I mentioned earlier. You, you really need to worry about this one and watch out for it. 
Um, it's really about the entirety of the ecosystem that you're building, having proprietary data, having subject matter expertise baked into a product, having a machine learning loop so you have a flywheel of value creation so that as people use your product, you get more and more proprietary data, better models, and it becomes harder and harder and harder to replicate what you've done. Because you've got a bunch of customers in these big companies that are very difficult to sell into, and you have a bunch of proprietary data and product that requires a lot of different weird nuances to get right, and eventually it becomes like this is kind of your moat. But the idea that you're just going to have a moat based purely on some state-of-the-art machine learning model is just kind of nonsense at this point, I think. Um, software is eating the world. This is all the Mark and Drayson thing that we all know. Um, but I think it's very, very important, right? Like the vast majority of the really good machine learning people are clustered in like five companies globally, you know, in, at least in, in, in the Western world and another five in China. So you have basically 10 companies that have more or less all the smart machine learning people in the world for, you know, for all intents and purposes. And the rest of the, the, rest of the industries are kind of uh, in a tough spot, right? And they, they really can't get people. And so their, their only real story for being able to move into this new world where they're using intelligence in their software is by working with startups and working with vendors because they're not going to be able to hire machine learning teams. That's, a, that's a, something you can be sure of. So uh, and the, the cohort thing, as I mentioned, is, is really cool. We'll look at some, some research about this in a second. But already over 90% of the AI startups that have come out have been all uh, enterprise. Cool, so let's look at this. Um, this is what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, if you take a look, you can see that the vast majority of these exits are all um, coming from a huge, huge, huge number of companies on the enterprise side and on consumer, a very tiny number of companies. So the top five in enterprise uh, are giving you a pretty small percentage of the overall gains. The top five in consumer, it's nearly half, right? So it's a pretty big difference. Uh, somehow I've gotten some jank here, so don't worry about that. Um, like I said, merely scaffolding for the talk. Um, so, uh, if you look at these top three categories, right, um, I think this is very interesting to look at. So you have really only four markets that make up the majority of market cap in the U.S. and, and really globally. Um, tech, we don't count, we take ourselves out of there. We're not really an industry vertical in the way that I'm talking about here. We're the ones that are out there on the attack, so we take ourselves out. Um, finance, uh, healthcare, um, these are really the two largest and highest margin sectors in the world. So this is where I think really a lot of people should be focusing their attention uh, in the startup world. So if I were doing a vertical AI startup, which I'm doing them, <laughs> I would, uh, I would uh, very much be doing it in financial services and healthcare and life sciences. That's what I tell everybody to do. Energy is also very interesting. Energy and future of energy, material science, and the whole sustainability theme, that's also well worth some attention. A lot of other stuff though, I see people spending time on, you know, they're just not thinking about, they're not talk, thinking about the TAM, like the, what's the actual market size there, and what's the, uh, what's the sort of margin that you could expect to see at scale in, in that business, right? Um, so this is what I, what I mentioned earlier, right? If you look at the dollars invested in a number of companies out there, vast majority of it already enterprise when you look at AI startups. This is a little, this is my awesome like spreadsheet clustering here that I did. Um, so you can see, uh, if you look by unicorns, you know, what are the different kind of areas that people are focused on? And I kind of zoomed in on, on fintech as a good example of like how I like to tell people to think about doing this kind of analysis. So if you look at like sort of the vertical areas, you can see again like healthcare is in there, it's getting healthy investment. Fintech is in there, obviously very interesting. So if I were going to do a fintech startup, what I would do is I would kind of zoom in and look at what people are doing now and what's overfished. So what that tells me on the left hand side, on your right, is uh, that I would probably do something in real estate. I would probably not do something in lending or in payments because there's been such a massive amount of investment there already. And you have highly valued, big winners, big cohorts already out there putting the shot on gold. It's like that era of companies, the big 
first wave of fintech lending and payments companies, those are already out there. Those shots on goal have already been made. I probably wouldn't do that right now. That's not to say that there won't be a good opportunity for that soon, but if I were gonna do something right now, I would do it in real estate and insurance. Um, next, if you take a look at um, the, I think the right hand side on this one is the interesting one to look at. Just different applications, like what are people doing with AI? If I cluster these startups based on the application they say they're doing. So underwriting is all coming from lending because there's been a small number of these lenders that have gotten pretty highly valued and built and raised a lot of capital. Um, otherwise, you see a lot of analytics, prediction, some computer vision. Um, so these are the kind of applications you're seeing out in the wild. I'll tell you about a few companies that, that I'm involved in, and just like as some sort of examples and case studies of building these kind of companies, you can now kind of synthesize this into some concrete uh, you know, view of what I really mean. So Merlon is uh, a company that I'm CEO of, and you can see some of them there in the back if you want to ask them questions later on. Um, we have Kevin here in front as well. Um, so. We, we deal with uh, the horrendously unsexy problem of um, identity risk screening for big banks. So KYC, AML kind of stuff. Um, so this means you want to decide whether or not you accept a customer, and if you do accept a customer, you will need to monitor them on an ongoing basis and make sure they're not doing really bad stuff. So this problem is huge. Banks spend about $100 billion on this annually, actually, so it's tremendously large, so that's great. Um, they get fined about $35 billion a year on average over the past decade, which is roughly similar to the size of fraud in the banking system. So that's also good for us, bad for them. Um, because it's a catalyst, what, what I'm looking for is what's going to make people buy something from me right now. Like, uh, because I don't want to sell stuff to people that they don't really want. Even if it's a problem, like a lot of startups will start off saying, you know, this is broken, like that's my, my most hated way to start a pitch, is like X is broken. It's like, so what? Everything's broken. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Do I want to fix it right now? Yes or no? If I want to fix it now, great. Now, you know, tell me that. Tell me why somebody wants to fix it now. Don't tell me that it's broken, because that's a given. Nothing works. Let's, just, let's be honest with ourselves. Um, so, we were able to go from zero to production in this domain in 15 months. I had no previous experience in banking. I knew nothing about any of this stuff. I really still don't really know what I'm doing, to be honest. Um, but we're making money somehow. We're out there doing it. Um, it's really all these guys. They know what they're doing. Um, so, we, you know, this was a great kind of example of this go-to-market playbook. You can go into a domain that's so hard, like selling something to, in compliance to a big bank as a new AI startup with all these compliance people afraid of AI and how are we going to validate this with the regulators and everything else. Um, you can do it, so this is a great, a great example of that. Um, I can talk later if anyone is interested about all the tricks and shenanigans in order to, to go to market that quickly. Um, we did 5 million in bookings in our first year. Uh, we got a goal of getting to 25 in our second year. Um, and we've built like a really great set of kind of uh, capital partners and advisors from the domain. That's one of the hacks. Like basically we have an advisory board of former regulators, former bank executives. Our investor community includes <laughs> a number of former bankers, former regulators, our good friends here at Workbench who have a great amount of experience dealing with enterprise sales in big banks. So, and basically what we do, you can see the thing on the right there, is like, take what today is, you know, 20 different vendors and different processes using different point solutions, roll it up into a really simple solution so that you can basically see an entire view of, of a individual's risk in, in one screen, right? So we use a lot of machine learning and NLP to check people's names against media content, against lists of bad guys, um, look at their graph their, you know, their, of connections and so on, and kind of understand uh, you know, how likely is it this person is really a bad actor that we don't want to do business with. Uh, a few other examples. Uh, Health Mode is a company that does uh, clinical trial optimization. So clinical trials is the uh, most expensive and time-consuming part of bringing new drugs to market. So this is kind of a bottleneck in, in pharma, basically. 
um, takes uh, a decade and well into the billions of dollars to bring a new drug to market, and over 90% of that is because of clinical trials. Um, what we found there was that the biggest, the biggest issue in a lot of ways is, is what's called like digitizing endpoints, or basically the feedback about what's going on. So, for example, uh, we have this cough experiment that we've done recently for, with cough. Um, the state-of-the-art thing that they do in healthcare is that you have to go into the hospital, they literally duct tape a mic to you, and then you walk around for a day with this mic duct taped to your chest, and then it's like recording you coughing, right? And then you go back again, and they rip off the duct tape, which I'm sure hurts pretty badly, and then, and then some dude counts the coughs later on. <laughs> so that's actually what they do. When I first heard about this, I was like, no, that's, that's, that's t tell me what they really do, right? And he's like, no, no, seriously, this is what we do. <laughs> wow, you yeah. know, okay. So this is like pretty typical. There's a lot of these kinds of things where you would, ima you would, you would not believe how they're measuring like health outcomes. And, and this causes like huge amount of problems. So you, this gets down into the weeds of like how you dissect one of these domains. So in this particular case, right, like, Recruiting is one of the biggest bottlenecks for a clinical trial. So you might have a trial at which the phase itself takes only 12 weeks, but then it takes 14 months to get the people recruited into the trial. So you can't, so the entire thing uh, takes way, way, way longer, an order of magnitude longer than the trial itself should take just to get the people there. Um, and one of the reasons that they can't get these people is because in order to screen them, they again have to bring them to the hospital to do things like this cough thing you know, or, or other ridiculous tests. They can't do any of this stuff remotely or virtually because none of it is digitized. Whereas obviously you should be able to do something like cough into your iPhone or something like that at this point, right? There's no reason to go to a hospital and have them duct tape stuff to you. It's ridiculous. So, um, you know, where you kind of have to go, you know, find your way. Ultimately, this goal of this thing is to sort of have a completely virtual, fully digital platform for running an entire clinical trial end to end, but you have to find, you know, maneuver your way around and find the right entry point. Um, Babcock and Bunbright, very weird name, we call it B&B. &B. I think we're gonna have to rename this thing. Uh, <laughs> terrible name. Uh, I don't know who came up with that. Uh, definitely about me, for sure. Um, so this is a real estate prediction, uh, real estate pricing. So there, what we found is like there's a massive, massive amount of uh, time and money being spent uh, on appraisers, you know, people that kind of go out to a house and do a bunch of stuff and then come up with a price. Um, and this, this again, can be basically fully automated using machine learning, uh, not just for generating a price, but also uh, generating an entire valuation report. So, you know, we use satellite imagery, interior and exterior imagery, we aggregate loads of publicly available data, um, and so on and so forth, and we basically can price within uh, now 5% uh, median error. Uh, we can tell you how much your high price, uh, house will be sold for, you know, instantly, and we'll be within 5%, um, and we'll be within 2% if we know the listing price in advance. And so the customers here are also, you know, go, that go, that's going into banking. Obviously, anyone who has collateral, collateral risk. So if you're underwriting mortgages, if you're a big holder of mortgage-backed securities, or you're packaging mortgage-backed securities, or you're a real estate investor, all these people have collateral risk. And so that's, uh, that, that's what that venture is attacking. Um, we have another one. How much more time do I have? Am I coming up on time? Yes, because the... I have a whole bunch of stuff, like five minutes, okay. I have a bunch of cool stuff to meander through here, but let me, I just, like I told you, I'm gonna like kind of randomly go through stuff. I already talked about Merlon, this one. Uh, I wanna show you some. So this is like a cool example from, from the real estate thing. I, I think this is a cool example of like productizing machine learning. Um, so what this is, right, is this is a basically unrolling what the model has learned and kind of dollarizing it, so that when you generate a valuation report, you can show what are the features that are adding the most value or detracting the most value from this home. So you can see the size, the traffic, the remodeled kitchen, the window panes, the patio, and the recessed lighting, and the effect that they're having on the value of the home. And you can see 
um, the bad things that are going on, right? Like this guy doesn't have a pool and the neighborhood median does have a pool, right? So this is like keeping up with the Joneses, but um, actually putting dollars around it. Um, and this, this, is a, this is, I think, is a cool example of kind of mapping the machine learning model up to the domain and, and doing things in a way that it does build defensibility over time because it takes a while to sort of find out, you know, how, what are the right features to use? How do, you, how do you build this model such that you can unroll it and generate a report like this? Um, you know, it kind of takes quite a while to come up with this kind of stuff. And, and it's that full stack aspect um, of getting the right data, building the right models, productizing it in the right way, embedding the subject matter expertise that an appraiser would use that really does yield defensibility over time. It becomes difficult to copy all of that stuff when you look at it in its totality. Um, this is a cool example where they, in, in appraising they do a thing called comps. So in, in residential real estate, the pricing is largely driven based on just like nearest neighbor search effectively, right? They just pick like three properties which are most similar and closest. Um, obviously, you know, we are embedding these properties into a giant multi-dimensional hyperspace so we can do all kinds of cool stuff in terms of similarity. We can find homes against you know, loads of different similarity vectors, not just location. Um, so we generate like a ton of different comps and we feed those into the model. And um, so we can kind of generate an arbitrarily large set of comps instead of just picking three manually, which is what folks do now. Um, I already talked about this one, but I might want to show you a couple things as uh, examples of analysis. So it's a really, really awesome PM team on this startup. and. We've done some really cool market analysis for things like, so, you know, this digital endpoints probably mentioned, how do you find where to start? Because you're talking about basically digitizing every single way that you measure healthcare outcomes and using machine learning on top of sensors in order to do all that. So the, obviously it's a massive, massive undertaking, right? This is like, this, this thing will, this will still be going on long after all of us are gone this effort to try to like digitize all the way that we measure healthcare outcomes. So how do you figure out where to start? So we had this whole crazy evaluation matrix. We're looking at the int intrinsic value against the develop development complexity and kind of grouping these things based on disease areas, um, looking at it based on the therapeutic market size, um, get, kind of trying to give you a sense here of the level of analytical firepower that sometimes gets thrown into these things to figure out like where to start and how to focus. I think it's very, very important. A lot of people will randomly, you know, have two customer conversations and then they're like, oh, I'm pretty sure I've triangulated on, on the market, right? I think I know where to, so the likelihood you're gonna find something good when you're doing that is super low, right? Um, so this is this cough example I brought up earlier. Um, we, in a, we did this like hackathon and in 24 hours we built a pretty cool cough model. I'm not gonna go into all the details on that. Um, it, it worked really well actually. Um, Tower Street is a cyber insurance venture, so this is the last thing I, I wanna talk about before my time's up. Um, going at, this one's a shout out to all the security peeps from earlier on. Um, so is cyber insurance is interesting, right? So it's like, the value of the world's digital assets compared to physical assets is arguably, you know, more on parity. Whereas the the property insurance market, the PNC market versus the uh, cyber market is like radically different. It's off by like a thousand fold. Um, so we're not really insuring or transferring very much of the security risk. And the reason why is because it's quantified super poorly. So it's the same situation that used to be the case for natural catastrophe risk, like hurricanes and earthquakes and so on. Um, none of that stuff was really transferred because who wants to take the risk of your house randomly getting wiped out by a hurricane? And the answer used to be nobody until they built good physical models and then they could model it and then the insurance industry got comfortable with the risk and now it's one of the largest risk categories in the world. And that happened during the 80s and 90s into the early 2000s, and now it's, it's really a, an active and very liquid market. Um, with cyber, we're, we're really very early on in that process, so this company is really an effort at trying to, to really do this very well. So it's been in deep stealth for two years, building the world's best breach data set uh, and building partnerships with our capital partners so we can go out and underwrite 
uh, massive limits, up to a, a billion dollars or more in uh, cyber insurance cover. And we provide tools directly to the CISO, CFO level stakeholders, specifically around the financial risk, so like a, a traditional enterprise risk management type approach where you can see the financial losses that you can sustain. So we're, we're mapping your assets out, we're mapping out the threats against those assets, and then where we have a, this crazy underwriting model, which basically allows you to understand the risk of loss um, based on loads of different factors. So I'll go into a little bit of that for a second, and then I'll be done. So you can see we have like over, we've aggregated over 15,000 unique, unique breaches that are affecting materially large corporates. It's a pretty large amount of breaches. Um, 40K overall breach events that we see uh, across one and a half million companies. Um, we have a, our feature vector for this model that's going into the model is three and a half thousand uh, wide. So we have a lot of corporate profile information, financial information, security features, hacker motivations, all that kind of stuff is in there. And we have a really cool uh, security risk assessment model, of course. So this is kind of like giving you a little bit of a view into what like this kind of deep domain modeling looks like, right? So you have uh, data sources feeding into these, uh, don't worry about what a Bayesian GLM is, not, some of you may know, but not here to explain to the rest. Sorry guys. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, we're able to take expert input into this model, which is I think an important last note to, to make. So. Um, uh, this is a great example, actually, of, a do of something that's extremely hard to replicate. This is, this is really, really, really hard to replicate because it's not just a really good machine learning model and data set that we put together and so on, but actually it's, it's very complex because you have a setup where um, some of these variables are observed at the time of breach and some of them are not observed because you may know a bunch of historical information about this company and the state that it was in at the time it was breached. But there isn't anyone that really does a good job of giving you really rich security information features at the time that those companies were, were breached. So all that stuff you have, to, you, have to, you have to initialize using expert input, right? So this is why you use a Bayesian model because you initialize priors based on what's called a licitation of experts approach. So you elicit input from a bunch of different experts and you kind of have different ways of weighing that and calibrating that and incorporating it into the model as your best guess. And then as you conduct like a deeper security assessment over time, and then you start to gather a really good data set over time of like what, what the company really looked like from a security perspective at the time when it sustained this large loss due to an incident, then now you can kind of model that better. And it's kind of interesting, all the publicly available data and vendor data that we've tried to throw into the model it all got regularized out, meaning like it didn't, it didn't have any impact. So it, that was kind of interesting and kind of surprising. Um, so I won't go into this, but this kind of a, look, shows the crazy amount of domain modeling that's going on just to understand the losses that are sustained after a security incident. And one of the reasons why you, we have such a poor visibility into the risk of loss and the quantification of the security uh, incidents is that it, it's very complex how companies lose money after they have a breach, right? It's not just that they pay their users, um, you know, for losing their data or whatever. There's so many different things that happen when they violate different regulatory uh, constraints and then they have to do things that fall on for that. So we have this loss event graph and we kind of, for each individual industry, we actually have to go in and create this crazy huge loss event graph specific to that one industry. And then that's actually all built into the model. So good example where it's like very, very complex to build the subject matter expertise in with the modeling, but over time it becomes very defensible. Um, cool, that's it for me. <laughs> Do I get questions too? Sweet. Yes, go ahead. You're welcome. Um, you said that uh, a lot of big enterprises are interested in acquiring startups because they have the problem that they can't get their own AI teams uh, on the 
people, but we also have that same problem of hiring. Everyone we want to hire can also go to your former employer or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about your strategy for how you get your machine learning engineers or how you make machine learning engineers out of people that show up with the right stuff and they don't have the experience yet? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a challenge, right? There's more, more demand than supply. So um, I think the most important thing is really to ask yourself if you deserve to have those machine learning engineers. <laughs> Meaning like, you know, is this, is my stuff really interesting? Do I really need these people? And, and you know, to, and so on and so forth, right? And then if you do, um, then I think really the most important thing is it, it's still, it's inside, it's inside baseball. Like it's still a very small world and a very small community and people know, you know, who know what they're doing and who doesn't know what they're doing. And so you, you should put a huge amount of work into getting a, the strongest possible anchor person that you can. That's what I think. Um, that's really the only way that you're going to build a great machine learning team is that if, if it is to have one really, really, really good anchor person who's like really on the inside and very well respected by the community and people know that that person is phenomenal. And when they interact with them, they're like, man, I want to work in this research group. This person is phenomenal. Um, everything else that you do is going to be tough because you're always going to be like the outsider trying to come to the inside. And the more and more noise that's gone on in the machine learning like uh, world, um, the more skeptical everybody becomes, obviously. So when you want to reach out to really good people, they're just very curmudgeonly now and nasty and they don't want to, you know, talk to anyone and stuff. So you need to get, you know, into the inside if you, I think, if you really want to build an awesome team. Um, definitely training people up and so on is a great idea, but again, like, who's going to do that? You need to have, a, you know, a person, like, a thing in place to do that. So I always tell people, like, first of all, make sure that you really do need a, a serious machine learning team for what you're doing. You know, like, is it, that's what I mean by do I deserve to have this, do I need to have this? Is this a, so interesting that somebody really world class would want to lead a research group doing this? And then if so, just put all your energy into finding that person. Next. Yes. Um, subject matter expertise. Um, you said you have a vetted, mm -hmm. so is the expectation that those subject matter experts are embedded for the long haul in a startup, or is the idea that there's Yeah, good, good question. Uh, so the question was like, do do the subject matter experts need to be embedded? And if so, like really for the long haul? And I think the answer is is a strong yes. But the thing, the caveat for this is actually in the very beginning, I I think that it's better to have those people as advisors. And because in the very beginning, if you're not coming from the domain, you have to remember in the very beginning, you really have no idea what the hell you're doing at all. And so you try to hire somebody in, you're almost certainly going to be wrong. And then you're going to have to fire that person that's going to get angry at you and leave. Um, it's going to end badly. So instead, you want to kind of get advisors and gradually learn what you're doing and have them help and give you input. And then as you, maybe you get your first customer or two, and as you start to get your feet on you and understand really, okay, like these are the people that I need, you know? I need exactly like this profile to help with product. I need exactly this profile to help with sales. Um, then, yeah, then you hire them in full time and they're there permanently. Yeah, that's what I think. But I, I think be careful about the preemptive hiring because it's easy to be very badly wrong. Um, where you have like, for example, if you look at in Merlon, like the, it, it's financial crime compliance, which is a very specific type of compliance. And there's lots of other bank compliance people that know basically nothing about this stuff. But they know about loads of other kind of compliance stuff. And for me coming in in the beginning, I'm like, these are compliance people, right? I don't know. It's all the same, right? And then you start realizing, like, no, it's super different. Then. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, a lot of like the global uh, addressable markets, a lot of different uh, sectors. Uh, I was curious about the specific real estate and kind of uh, where you saw the most growth potential. You talked a lot about the appraisers. Why, why appraisers and not the mortgage brokers themselves or some of the other guys that are getting way higher margin fees than maybe? Yeah, good question. So, we, uh, the uh, thing about kind of displacing the manual appraisal process is actually just the Trojan horse in that venture. That's not like the end game. The end game is, uh, is actually to take risk and be a real estate investor. Um, 
but the problem is um, this is very hard to do super well because you actually need to be able to statically price effectively, but then you also need to be able to have like basically demand forecasting models, right? Which involve like understanding how incomes and other things like that are gonna change within a jurisdiction because then you're predicting the price. I'm saying in real estate is a long-term hold kind of a scenario from an investment perspective. So it's extremely complex to build these investment models that are looking out, you know, a decade. And that's, that's the end game for this, right? So that's the, the big, big opportunity that we see. And so this was, we felt, the fastest go to market to, to prove out the V1 pricing models that just statically price, right? Like pricing what this house could sell for if I liquidated it right now. Um, but the, the stage two of the venture is going to be to ba basically be sort of like a quant hedge fund for real estate, pretty much. And to start different kinds of private equity funds and real estate funds. Um, and the tech venture will serve kind of as a management entity. Um, so this is, I think, a very interesting theme in fintech. It's the same thing that we do with the cyber insurance venture that I mentioned, that, that actually takes risk. So it's not like the, the sort of cyber analytics companies that are selling their data or their analytics to insurance companies or to other tech companies. It's actually an underwriter. So it takes the risk. And this is the same approach that we're taking with this uh, real estate venture. So think about like the fintech lenders or whatever, right? It's a similar kind of thing. So it goes to my full stack point earlier, right? It's like, the more of the stack I can eat, the happier I am with the business, right? So if I, if I can sell a pricing model to a bank, I'm cool with that for a little while, but eventually I want to do the whole thing myself and go and invest in real estate, right? Even with Merlon, we're looking at taking the identity risk outside the bank. So first step, we're selling enterprise software. Soon we want to run the entire KYC process on top of our tech stack. Then we want to have analysts inside Merlon and then get the banks to allow us to run the entire KYC process outside the bank. And we want to transfer the financial risk of those bad actors so that basically we can say, hey, let your customers off in with Merlon. We're going to do the screening on our side and we'll guarantee you there's zero uh, risk of any of these people becoming bad actors. Um, and we'll actually eat that risk if they do. We'll eat the losses, right, using insurance. So to the extent that I can really take all the risk on my side, I want to, right? Because if I believe in my models, I should want to do that. And the more of the risk I can take, then the better the business that I have. Um, so it's a good question because that's actually just like a Trojan horse in that venture. One last question. Yeah. What do you think of media as a vertical? So it's right to the green. Oh, media is a rubbish vertical, man. Still <laughs> far, far, far away. Seriously, it's a... It's an industry in a, in a horrible, horrible decline, and it's, and it's really doomed. Um, it's true. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, listen, we were in that business in, in my last company, and what you saw happen was, was really that everything moved to social, right? And like, that's distribution now. And so the media companies are really, they're, they're, they're screwed, basically. And the tech companies are just eating all of their all of their dollars, right? So all the revenue has already shifted over to Google and Facebook and places like that. And then now the tech companies are making the content, like Amazon and Netflix and people like this. So I don't know if you want to get into media, like go to Netflix or Amazon or something and make TV shows or something, right? Because um, if you want to build enterprise tech, then the question is who are you going to sell it to? Because the tech companies aren't going to buy it because they're they're the tech. They're not going to buy your tech. So that's not going to work. So who do you sell it to? Hearst Media? You know? I don't think so, man. Stay away from the media vertical. <laughs> so I'm telling you, like, don't, I, you don't want to crash your boat on the shore and, you know, that might, people have to come up and pick you up off the beach and stuff. The Coast Guard, you know, coming in. Don't want to mess with it. Bad idea. Go home and yeah, sorry, man. Sorry. Yeah. I'm trying to. It's better to be real. It's better to be real, you know. Entrepreneur to entrepreneur. It's better to be real. You don't want to go through the pain, man. Some of us have already done it. Look at the reader space, like a zombie. So you got Flipboard out there, like, it's got like an arm coming out of its back and stuff. It's like, yeah. And with that, let's get around.